This is the fourth and final presentation for Chapter 8. We're going to be talking about touch, smell, dress, appearance. We'll start with haptics, which is tactile communication, in other words, the use of touch. We'll be talking about touch avoidance, prohibited touch. The touch is something, obviously, that, that varies significantly across cultures. It varies quite a bit uh, within the cultures in terms of what the context is uh, between the people that we're, we're talking about. <clears throat> but there's also this kind of general distinction in terms of touch. There tend to be cultures where you touch a lot, um, and uh, those are uh, principally the uh, Middle Eastern and Latin American cultures. There's moderate contact, moderate touch culture with the United States. In some ways, I would tend to put the United States also <laughs> maybe in this non-contact culture. Um, it's certainly uh, the case that non-contact cultures are, are particularly Asian Asian countries. Um, in the in the text, it was kind of interesting uh, reference to this study that um, that uh, counted the number of touches per hour uh, in a <laughs> cafe. And uh, in, uh, it was measured in, uh, in a city in Puerto Rico and in Paris. And the number of touches in both cases was over 100 uh, in the space of an hour. Uh, in the United States, it was two. And in London, uh, which is probably the capital <laughs> non-touch world, um, it was zero. Uh, so kind of, kind of interesting. And I think that's probably typical of, uh, of, of Anglo culture that it's uh, probably not as adverse to contact, uh, personal touch contact as Asian cultures, but certainly uh, close to it. <clears throat> How do um, cultures differ in terms of touch? Well, they differ, as we were just talking about, the overall amount of touching, but also the places where people can be touched, the expectation about who touches whom, the occasions, um, settings in which that uh, touch is acceptable. And uh, let's, let's start by looking at um, here an example of uh, a cultural faux pas. This is taken from uh, the uh, movie Outsourced. So here we have an American uh, in India. Oh, just eat. <laughs> Very nice, fresh, absolutely. <laughs> mm -hmm. mm. That's good. Um. <clears throat> <coughs> what? Um, Sir, you should not place the hand that has been in your mouth back in the food. <laughs> and uh, you should not eat with your left hand. Uh, in India, we eat with the right hand. Uh, left hand is considered to be... Uh, uh, dirt, dirt. Uh, unclean. Unclean, unclean, yeah. Why? Why? Uh, uh, okay. So what were the problems there? Uh, well, uh, we saw that um, he used his left hand. And it, it was very clear that uh, you don't do that <laughs> and why you don't do that. India is not alone in that. Um, that there are a number of countries where, where you simply don't, don't eat with your left hand. You don't uh, greet somebody. You don't uh, shake hands, certainly, with your left hand. Um, we're moving on to um, the... Uh, a, a topic that might seem kind of strange, <laughs> sense of smell, all factics. Um, but in fact, I think that this is uh, something that's important, but uh, it's not understood very well. We think of it as being important for animals, but uh, actually humans have also have the capability of, of detecting smells. I think we think that dogs are, are really good, humans not so good, but humans are, are, are quite sophisticated as well. In terms of, of how smell works culturally, 
Um, it, it works, obviously, as something that's important in uh, relationships um, between the sexes, but it's also, uh, depending on the culture, a, a marker for social class distinction. So if somebody bathes, bathes on a regular basis, uses perfume, um, that likely is an indication in a lot of cultures um, about what class that uh, social class that person belongs to. In most cultures, there are smells that are acceptable and, and others that, that, that aren't, both in terms of, of people, in terms of general smells. Uh, it's particularly the, the case with foods. I, I think that, that, that one, one would find varies considerably country to country. This is a sign that uh, you might see in um, some Asian countries, in Malaysia or Singapore, for example, no durians. Uh, <laughs> there's a fine for that. Um, those are um, very highly prized uh, fruits. Uh, they taste really good, um, kind of like bananas, and you know, kind of a mild uh, taste. But they have an awful smell, just just unbelievably bad. Um, and you can't bring them into hotels or other public spaces. Okay, we're going to move on to uh, physical appearance in dress. This is obviously something that's very important in sending messages uh, when we meet somebody. We look at uh, how they are, uh, how how they they're dressed, what their general appearance is, color of their skin, their hair, um, other other aspects of of how they look, and that's that's important. And people realize that's important, and they take that uh, into account. And obviously, cultures have rules for, for how you dress and how you don't dress. Uh, depends, uh, obviously, on one's age, sex, and so forth. Status within the culture. One of the things that, um, that we've seen in the past is important um, in terms of in-group uh, membership or, and in-group status is, in fact, uh, how you're dressed. Um, we're going to look at some examples of clothing in, across different cultures. Uh, we're going to start with women's clothing in Islamic countries, which has been a controversial issue. Um, not so much in those countries, but when, uh, when those are seen in, in the West. So we're going to look at, first of all, uh, the hijab. Uh, that, that's uh, something that's very common, the headscarf. In moderate Muslim countries like uh, Morocco or uh, Algeria, for example, um, and um, this is something that um, is is widespread by um, Muslim uh, women, widely used by Muslim women in the West as well. Less common in the West is the burqa, uh, which is a complete covering of the body and the and the face. Um, this is something that uh, has caused a lot of controversy in France. Uh, in fact, uh, the burqa cannot be worn in schools um, and um, and is restricted in in fact in particular public uh, public spaces there's also the abaya uh, and the nijab and the nijab um, is the uh, face veil that, that you see here so uh, wearing the abaya which is the kind of black robe uh, and the nijab together um, covers almost as well as the burqa can still see the eyes, but but that's that's all. Well, where does this come from? Well, the various um, explanations for for um, this uh, this uh, choice of, of of clothing for women in Islamic countries. One is uh, scripture, the Quran, uh, that calls for um, uh, women to be modest and and cover themselves. And this is one passage from the Quran. There are a couple that that address that issue. Um, but it's also a byproduct of a very hot climate. Um, it might seem strange that, that, that you'd wear more clothes in a hot climate, but if you look at how people uh, dress in the desert, they don't dress in, in shorts and a t-shirt, uh, but rather they, they wear clothes that, that actually uh, uh, protect them from, from the sun. Um, and um, one aspect of that also is uh, the kind of very formal relationships um, that one finds in Islamic countries uh, and the strict separation between men men and women. And uh, so for modesty, it's, it's uh, sake, and that's another 
reason that uh, that women uh, are, are covered uh, with uh, with a hijab or burqa or abaya. <clears throat> uh, how how this is seen in the West is often quite different in how uh, w Islamic women uh, view their dress. They they see this as a as a way to uh, to show respect for uh, their religion and their culture. In the West, it's seen often as demeaning to women and uh, as a sign that, that women do not have uh, any rights or don't have the same rights as, as women in the West, but uh, certainly not, uh, not all women in Islamic countries view it that way. It's been a controversial issue, not, not just in France, but in a number of other countries as well, in, in Britain, for example. We look at uh, a couple of other um, traditions in terms of uh, dress. In Africa, this is an example from Kenya. Um, one finds traditional clothing that uh, that plays a number of roles. One of the important roles it, it plays is it it uh, indicates the status of the individuals, not just their status status in the social hierarchy, but for example their marital status uh, as well uh, is, is often indicated by, by dress. Um, the text talks about a couple of other cultures that are kind of interesting in terms of distinctive clothing, the dhoti, uh, the, the male clothing in India, and the sari, um, um, in indication there, kind of a, um, what one finds very often in traditional clothing that uh, women's clothing is, is quite expressive and colorful men's to be fairly plain. We have that distinction as well in, in Japan where you have uh, uh, kimonos that are actually worn by both men and women but more more commonly by women and certainly more colorful. We have the obi which is a sash that goes around the kimono as well. You have the uh, yukata which is worn in the summer that's a um, lighter uh, style of kimono. Um, made, usually made out of cotton. And the same thing holds true for kimonos that we were talking about in terms of, of African traditional dress that uh, very often the kimonos also will, will indicate something about the woman wearing, wearing that kimono, uh, for example, the, the marital status. <clears throat> One of the things that's interesting about appearance and dress, as we were talking about before, is that well, when you meet somebody for the first time, um, you size up that person based on how they look. Um, so if it's somebody with tattoos all over and and a lot of body piercings, uh, very often there'll be stereotypes uh, associated with that. Let's look at a concrete example. Here's a, um, a young black American, looks very clean cut, uh, looks like your, your typical teenager. But what happens when he looks like this, uh, wearing a hoodie? Well, this is in fact uh, Trayvon, um, uh, what was his last name? Mm, Trayvon Williams, is that? <clears throat> the young man who was um, killed um, in Florida uh, by somebody from the neighborhood watch uh, who saw him walking through a gated community. It's a young black guy wearing a hoodie and uh, this was a, a major factor in, uh, in why he was stopped and why the, 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 the person from the neighborhood watch found him uh, suspicious. So dress can, can be, uh, have a dramatic effect on, on how we perceive people. Um, one of the other th topics that's covered in this chapter is chronemics. Uh, this is something we've talked about before. We've talked about monochronic and polychronic time and, and how that differs. Um, calendars are, are, are the main thing that's used in terms of formal uh, time telling, give us uh, people a sense that they can control time. There are various calendars used in the world. Um, in the West, we use a solar calendar. Um, in other cultures, a lunar calendar is used. So, for example, in, in China, the um, New Year is the lunar uh, New Year, and it varies from year to year uh, because of that. The same for Easter, for example, in, in the Christian calendar. Um, and uh, so in, in most cases, in most countries, you have a combination that use a lunar ca uh, calendar. They actually have a combination of lunar and solar calendars, which is, for example, the case in, 
in China. Uh, time zones kind of interesting thing culturally, because we uh, I think we would assume that well all countries use time zones, um, including large countries, but uh, but not China. Uh, China is a large country. It, normally there would be four time zones there, uh, but there's only one time zone. Uh, it's kind of a a reflection maybe of the collectivistic nature of, of Chinese culture. Um, there are countries like the United States that have nine time zones. Uh, same is true of Russia. Russia has nine. Russia actually used to have 11 time zones and uh, it's reduced uh, recently. Um, but uh, uh, time is um, something that's viewed differently in different cultures in terms of, of being on time with something we talked about already. We were talking about uh, P time versus M time. Uh, we're going to talk very briefly. This is uh, something that I think is um, is addressed well in the textbook. So I'll just mention this uh, difference when we talk about nonverbal communication. This difference between individualism and collectivism. The fact that in individualistic cultures uh, we tend to put more distance uh, between people, uh, whereas in collectivistic cultures, which for in, in terms of population tend to be larger larger population more densely populated and uh, therefore uh, distance physical distance is not so easy to achieve you have to kind of find your distance so, so, uh, psych psychologically and we've mentioned already the the tendency in the United States and other individualistic countries particularly in the United States to to uh, to show your emotions kind of directly and to smile a lot uh, it's not the case in a lot of collectivistic cultures we're going to see an example of that in this clip uh, that uh, talks about uh, effects display in Japan okay for this next question it was a good one um, talking about facial expressions in Japan how do facial expressions differ from those in America well pretty much you're gonna have all the same facial expressions people will have the same ones but the thing I found most amazing that really actually confused me quite a bit was that people tend to try to keep a satisfactory facial expression no matter what they are talking to you about. Now what do I mean by that? Let me give you a little story. One night I was walking uh, with my girlfriend, now wife, um, down a neighborhood close to ours and we passed a shop in which she knew the owners of the shop. And one of them came out to talk to her, and I didn't know much Japanese yet. I was still pretty bad at it. And um, pretty much I couldn't make out the conversation too well, but I saw that the guy was smiling the whole time he was talking to her, so I figured he was giving her some good news. Later, after she translated pretty much for me, I found out he had just talked about his wife dying, and one of his daughter's friends had just died too, and he had just gone to both funerals. And what he had pretty much said was, Yes, recently all the women in my life are dying and I can't stop crying. He told this entire story with a very bright smile on his face and uh, some of the best demeanor I've ever seen. So, the reason for this is to make the listener feel comfortable. Um, even when telling a very harsh or even depressing story, a viewer will usually, uh, a, 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 the person telling the story will usually keep a satisfactory look on their face um, and not actually let their feelings seep through uh, with facial expression, which somewhat creeped me out and somewhat confused me, but after my girlfriend explained it to me, my wife explained it to me, um, I started to understand that this was just custom in Japan, but I was still very new to this. I didn't quite understand, so I was very confused. But um, don't always go by facial expression when someone's telling you a story. One of the very sometimes surprising and harsh lessons to learn in Japan. Um, one of the other things that uh, we can talk about in terms of uh, cultural uh, distinctions uh, in reference to nonverbal communication or um, what's, wh how, how we can see that in terms of differences in power distance, low power distance versus high power distance cultures, um, and in terms of low context, high context. And I think there's no surprise here that in low power distance cultures, they're less aware of uh, vocalics and take less cues, fewer cues from that. And high power distance cultures, we tend to avert uh, eye contact, show respect. Low context cultures tend to be more direct and talkative, 
Why is that? Well, that's because language speech is, is the primary means of, of, of sending a message there. High context cultures may pay, uh, pay more attention to nonverbal behavior. Um, so it's not, not only a language that conveys the messages. Uh, we're going to end with uh, just a reference to this, which is discussed um, uh, quite extensively in the textbook, so I'm not going to repeat that. But what we're talking about is, is what happens here with this nonverbal expectancy violations theory, is what happens when um, a convention in terms of nonverbal code and nonverbal communication uh, is violated. Um, and uh, we're going to take a look at a clip of that... Um, that illustrates that. Uh, it uh, uh, indicates that uh, it's a clip that shows a violation of touch behavior. And this is taken from the movie Gran Torino. And um, th here we have this um, distinction between uh, mainstream American culture, um, illustrated by Clint Eastwood, uh, the white character there, and the Hmong, uh, the Hmong family that he goes to visit. Well. What are all you fish heads looking at, anyway? I think we should go into the other room. Sorry. A lot of people in this house are very traditional. Number one, never touch a monk person on their head. Not even a child. Mong people believe that the soul resides on the head. So, uh, don't do that. Well, it sounds dumb, but fine. Yeah, and a lot of Hmong people consider looking someone in the eye to be very rude. That's why they look away when they look at them. Yeah. Anything else? Yeah, some Hmong people tend to smile or grin when they're yelled at. It's a cultural thing. It expresses embarrassment or insecurity. It's not that they're laughing at you or anything. Uh, you people are nuts. This clip uh, from Gran Torino illustrates a couple of distinctions, differences between uh, mainstream American nonverbal practices and uh, what we see among in the Hmong <coughs> community. Um, first and fo foremost, uh, Clint Eastwood thinks that he's just being friendly by patting the child on the top of her head. This is a big taboo in Hmong culture as it is in um, other Asian cultures. This is uh, sacred, the top of the head. This is uh, pointing towards heaven, so it's uh, uh, something that <coughs> that uh, you don't touch the top of a person's head, whether it's a child or not. Uh, Clint Eastwood is also uh, baffled by the fact that uh, the people in the family look down when he looks at them. This is uh, so they don't engage in direct eye contact. This is uh, a sign of respect. Um, they don't want to show that they are um, claim to be equals to him. And uh, finally, <clears throat> this smiling um, when in a difficult situation uh, doesn't mean that they're amused. This is similar to what uh, clip that we were looking at that uh, had to deal with uh, Japanese <clears throat> practices in terms of nonverbal communication very similar thing uh, that we see here. <laughs> 